So thank you for agreeing to do this and I will not keep you. So um, basically we know that exposure to violence, whether directly or as, as a bystander, can have really far-reaching negative consequences on children. And we today we have children who've been exposed to violence like literally all their life. Like we have children who've never known what peace are. We have countries that have been in violence and conflict for years, for decades, and it's still going on. So Dr. Taylor, as uh, uh, the executive director of End Violence, and also you are a British executive with both the government and the private sector, and you have experiences in this field. When we talk about the issue of ending all forms of violence against children, I feel it is seriously underfunded. What do we need to just get the political will and financial commitments that we need to ensure that we minimize or eradicate the impact of violence against children? Yeah, thanks, Mercy, for that, that introduction. I think we really need to make the case for investment to end violence against children. And by that, I mean making the human case, uh, the economic case, and the practical case. I mean, put differently, we need to make the case that ending violence against children is the right thing to do. It's a smart investment to make, and it's possible. And let me just unpack those three very briefly. Ending violence against children is, of course, right. It's not just a human right, but it's also right behind the big data of violence against children is every individual child, every individual story of a child who observes or experiences violence, abuse, or neglect, and often with multi-year, sometimes lifelong and intergenerational consequences. That's the right space case for ending violence. But there's a smart investment case to be made as well. We know that one billion children, one billion children every year experience violence, abuse, and neglect globally. And sadly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that number is even higher. Now, violence at that scale frankly, is an epidemic in and of itself. And it's been estimated that the cost of that to economies is between two and 5% of GDP. And that's a fairly staggering direct and indirect economic cost. So there is a smart investment case to be made for preventing and responding to violence against children. And then finally, it's possible. So this is not a narrative of huge numbers and despair. It is possible. We have really good evidence-based best practice. Uh, the Inspire strategies, uh, put together by about a dozen global agencies three or four years ago are the best practice informed on, by ongoing implementation of programs and strategies to end violence against children. We also have other strategies that are, are specific to a particular type of violence happening in a certain place, whether it's the call to action uh, in the Safe to Learn initiative or the We Protect Global Alliance model national response, which informs countries how to go about making the internet safe for children. Now, just finally to wrap on this question, just recently, I think two or three months ago, the World Health Organization published its global status report on preventing violence against children. And that report showed that while 80% of countries do have some kind of national action plan to end violence against children, only 20% of countries have a national action plan which is either fully funded or has the right measurements and targets uh, of approach. So there is a big gap between intent and implementation. So if I, I, a couple of things I think we have to do as a global community is to be sharing cost-effective evidence-based solutions, but advocating as well, making the investment case I just described to get the proportionate political commitment and financial investment. I really like when you say, you know, having evidence-based solutions. And you've talked about COVID-19 and the effect it is having on children. Now, you know, we have children who are experiencing emotional violence, physical violence, sexual violence. The list is endless just during the six months or so that we have been, you know, under this pandemic. And it is essential that, you know, if we have to build back better, then we have to put children at the center of the policies that we are making. I don't know, what do you feel is needed to keep children safe at home, even as we look forward to building back better, but it has to start now. Like how do we make these children safe at home, within the communities? How do we make them safe online? You've touched on this, but you can expound on it. And also when it comes to their learning and the disruption of schools and all that, what is it going to take? Yeah, that's such an important question because I, I see two sides to this. I see the impact that COVID-19 has had and is having and will have on children. Uh, but then I see emerging some opportunities of us. And I would, I would nuance a little bit from building back better to saying, let's build back safer. Uh, 
um, from COVID-19. Let's learn from this experience. So let me just speak to each of those very briefly. In terms of the impact, we know obviously that COVID-19 is having a huge direct health impact and it's having a huge direct and indirect economic impact. But it's also reversing development gains and it's also risking a lot of the progress that we've seen in recent years on child protection services and infrastructure and the progress made to protect children. And specifically, we've seen children at home. So at one point earlier this year, I think one and a half billion children were out of school and at home. And they were isolated, they had movement restrictions, they were under economic stress, they were overcrowding. So in those environments, we've seen an upturn in violence and abuse of children. At the same time, children's lives have moved much more online, um, much more time online, whether that's remote learning or socializing or playing games. But also it's not just children who have moved more online, it's actually the people who would wish to harm children. And we can talk about the range from cyberbullying right through to the very serious child sexual abuse and exploitation, uh, exploitation that takes place online. But those people, those perpetrators also moved online and were more easily enabled to, to hunt down the children online that they wish to harm. And then thirdly, the school piece, because of course, with so many children out of school, there's a real risk that there's a generation of children with a gap in their education. We've seen uh, evidence coming out and concerns that many girls in particular, once they leave school, will never go back to school. And even in this environment of increased remote learning, and frankly, whether that's in a developed country or whether it's in a less developed country, it doesn't matter. We are seeing across the world uneven access to digital devices and to internet connections, which are hindering that remote learning. So all of that then is what I think we're seeing during COVID-19. I do think we're learning in real time. And what gives me some optimism is that we've also seen, uh, I think, heightened awareness of violence against children. So I think the opportunity when we talk about building back better or building back safer is to leverage that heightened awareness, um, keep on sharing in real time, based on evidence, what is working to keep children safe at home, at school, online, pursuing new collaborations. And I've seen some of those develop at real speed, actually, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And make sure that we are collectively and collaboratively uh, pursuing the, the highest impact interventions and, and delivery mechanisms. Um, in the short term, I think it means continuing to advocate to make sure that child protection, that ending violence against children features appropriately in COVID-19 prevention and response plans. But then we also need to make sure that as governments and others turn their attention to post-COVID policy, to planning, to financing, that child protection and ending violence against children is featuring in there. And we have three particular initiatives. I won't cover them in massive detail, but one is called Pathfinding, where governments make a, a, a domestic public commitment to, uh, on top of the commitment they've already made to the SDGs in 2015. And that commitment is to end all violence in their country by 2030. They draw on global best practice. They get local data to inform preparation of a, of a domestic national action plan. And then with support from domestic and if necessary international partners, implement finance and, and measure progress against that plan. We have another initiative, Safe to Learn, which is, is, is a joint initiative of the uh, education sector and the end violence community, which is about schools who have such an important role, not just in education, but of course in children's broader development and preparation for adulthood. And we've seen during COVID that the absence of going to schools doesn't just remove the educational experience for many children or dilute that educational experience as it moves online. It removes peer networks, it removes reporting mechanisms of violence and abuse that might be happening at home and so on and so forth. So Safe to Learn is an initiative with multiple wins focused on the child's learning environment, which if we can make that safe, there's a multiple win of learn, improved learning outcomes, better leverage education investments, and children growing up safe and secure with a ripple effect more broadly for ending violence. And then just finally, because you mentioned it, Mercy, about the online piece, uh, our safety online portfolio is investing in those around children to make sure they are equipped to prepare children to be safe online. It's investing in uh, prevention measures and response measures. We're drawing on a huge network of global grantees now we have in the online space in nearly 70 countries, a huge evidence base is building. And we're using that also to inform uh, our global advocacy because we need to advocate to tech companies, to telecoms companies, to governments and others to have safety by design, to make their platforms safe and for governments to pass the right kind of legislation that will keep children safe online. Thank you very much. And, and, and I think you briefly touched on the question I was going to ask next. 
and the, you know the role of private sector because you've talked you've talked about the government and the policy uh, making decisions of the government and how they can come up with legislations that protect children but i would really like you to emphasize on the role of the private sector because like you say it's all about partnerships and you know collaborations and not just the government doing one thing on its own what can the private sector really do to ensure that children are safe and that and we end violence against children and especially um online because just like adults especially during this COVID 19 period we have children who are spending so much time online now that they are not going out to play and they're not going to school yeah, the private, the short answer to the question, the private sector can do a lot and it can do much more than, than it's often doing right now. So let me, let me unpack that a little bit. First of all, the M-Violence Partnership, we have about 450 members across every sector, whether that's government, civil society, faith groups, the private sector, UN agencies, academia, and others. And through the initiatives I just mentioned around pathfinding, safe online and safe to learn, uh, the private sector features uh, with and through our partners across all of those. So let me just call out three or four examples of where I think the private sector does act but could do more. First of all, the private sector must make its products, its policies, its supply chain safe for children. Uh, that should be kind of a no-brainer, it's the core business, but make your core business safe for children. So for example, tech companies and tech platforms and social media app developers, make them safe by design. Start with a principle of building these platforms, building these apps, et cetera, and these games for, on, on, for children to play online. Start with a principle of safety and have that as a design principle. Secondly, another example in, in, in that regard of, of products, platforms, and policies would be around child labor. Make sure your supply chains uh, have no child labor and your labor standards are high, not just for children, but for everyone. And then another example would be, I think, around trafficking, the human trafficking, the trafficking of children. And just to pick one example, we see the, uh, the tourism and travel industry taking steps in that direction because it, it, it is a, an unwilling but facilitator sometimes of that happening or, or, or a means for that to happen. But also the whole sports, uh, the sports sector as well. Sports, of course, is a multi-billion dollar global business. And we know that trafficking really picks up around sports events, major global sporting events. So there's just two or three examples of safety by design on tech platforms, making sure there's no child labor in your supply chains and uh, making sure that trafficking of children is not possible around major sporting and other events. The second area where the private sector uh, can play a role, and this may sound more positive, it, it can provide critical services. And the flip side of what we're seeing, I guess, during the COVID-19 with so many children moving online, is that the private sector, the tech companies, telecoms companies have a huge role to play in making sure children are connected to their friends, to their families, to their teachers and educators. Um, and so we need to make sure that when private sector companies are providing those critical services, it's safe. So it's safe access to digital devices, safe access to connectivity and learning spaces that are created, whether it's e-platforms or even private companies who help provide and fund and set up the infrastructure for helplines, which are so important. Um, and for victim support. So there's a big role there for the private sector to provide critical services. Third, I would say the private sector has a, an unusual, maybe unique reach in terms of raising awareness. So use their networks, their infrastructure, their employees, their huge consumer connections globally to both raise awareness of issues around ending violence, but also to make sure that people, parents, caregivers, and others have access to, to the best, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, best in class evidence and best practice of what can be done to keep children safe. And finally, from their own experience, um, the private sector can share data, evidence and insights, which itself can be so informative for the broader programs, which governments and others can then take to scale to protect all children. Wow, thank you so much. I think we'll leave it at that because there's a lot, I feel like there's a lot to discuss around issues. Um, uh, regarding children and how to protect them and keep them safe, especially during this COVID-19 period. But thank you so much for your insight. And yes, hope we have some time again to talk about this. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mercy. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.